Thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight. My name is Fatma Dosari, the Executive Director of Far America Institute, QAI. Uh, we are a cultural organization that does culture exchange between the US and Qatar. And we celebrate creatives, American and Qatari. Um, and we're here very fortunate today to have two creatives from two American universities that have satellite branch campuses in Qatar. Uh, Professor Marco Williams from Northwestern University and Professor Michael Dyson from Georgetown University. Also, we have our entertainers here tonight, the musicians who also have experiences in Qatar. And after our talk, they're going to share their experiences. We have Elijah Jamal Bodbud and Mark G. Meadows. Um, we're very happy to have you here. This is part of our celebration. This is part of our celebration of Black History Month. So thank you so much for joining us. And I will leave the mic now to Professor Mark Williams. Uh, it's great to be here. And I want to thank um, everybody at the Qatar America Institute for first finding me and then uh, being very persistent in uh, trying to corral me. Uh, and then when it came time to help me figure out what I might talk about to, to be my guide, uh, I am very grateful. And why am I grateful? Uh, I've spent two years in Qatar uh, at Northwestern University, and it was two of the most significant and profound years of my life. And so when I was uh, asked to come down and... and be here, I said yes. <laughs> but of course, uh, how could I not uh, wish to share a little bit about my, in many ways, very limited experience, but as I said, very satisfying. Uh, I wrote some words down on, on the page, but I think I'll dispense with them except for maybe one uh, specific part, so you'll forgive me while I flip through some pages because it's a, uh, a page of words written by uh, young people from Qatar that I'd like to share with you. Uh, my, my, my time tonight will be brief. Uh, it'll be augmented by um, some visuals. And really, if you will, the theme is, to, is this idea of the stories we tell or the stories that are told about us. And as I was looking through some paperwork, I saw that the Northwestern mantra is tell stories that matter. And so that's really why I'm here, because I'd like to share with you what, it, what matters to me. So I, like perhaps many Americans, went to uh, Qatar not knowing too much about it, knowing a, a large military base there. Uh, not knowing really much more than that. And it was wonderful to get there and to, to sort of discover and learn uh, an origin story about the country, uh, one that shifted it from the, the very easy narrative of a place that has a lot of oil, right? That's what everybody sort of thinks of, Qatar oil, at least maybe prior to the World Cup. Uh, now we're thinking about the, the World Cup. I really discovered a place that I found not simply fascinating, but warm and generous. And most specifically, I'm now going to offer you a paradox of my experience. I really came to know the place through the students that I taught. Uh, a wedding, having tea and dates in the modulus, uh, being gifted and wearing a thobe and a gutra. All this came from students. And in, in some ways, I think this could make sense to some who perhaps visited. Qatar, like many Middle Eastern countries, is very family-centric. Uh, uh, and so my access point to the culture and the country and its people were through this young people that I taught. And if you know me, uh, it's not a surprise because I don't, I demand of my students to know who they are. So if I have a student in my class and she 
comes in after the weekend, and I say, what did you do over the weekend? And she says, nothing. I say, you did something. If I say, uh, where did you go? Nowhere. I interrogate, and I push, and I demand. And so this, this presence, this personality, this American, uh, this black American, this New Yorker, who uh, comes to them and with a certain kind of attitude and style, but it also requires that I tell them that my stories, my narrative, my experience. I get to teach the, the fun stuff. I teach filmmaking. I teach the stuff where you create, where you tell stories. And so it's in this space where I also got to learn very much about the stories that these young people bring with them to a place, the stories that they are beginning to tell, and most importantly, the stories that they wish to tell. In screenwriting, you ask students to tap into, you know, what's personal to you. In my directing classes, even as I brought scenes from around the world, I asked them to teach, I asked them to interpret the scenes from their own perspective. And I'll give you one brief anecdote. There's a uh, scene from an American film called Revolutionary Road. It stars Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. And it's a scene where a husband and wife are arguing with each other. Well, one of the best classes I ever taught was this class. I asked the students to do an interpretation of the scene. I don't tell them what the scene is about. All of the female students saw the male character, the husband, as being at fault. All the male students saw the, the, the wife as being at fault. And that allowed us to have a great conversation about bias, uh, where you come from, how you see the world. And so in this way, the directing class uh, allowed me to get them to use other material as a way to begin to share and tell themselves, tell about themselves. But the greatest example, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm going to be very brief because I, there is something up on the screen that I will share with you. But the best example really comes from uh, a class that I taught last spring called writing and creating the web series. And in this class, I taught 16 students. All but two were seniors, many of whom I had taught multiple times, so they knew me. Uh, 12 of the 16 were female. Eight of the 16 were Qatari. 15 of the 16 were Muslim, one Lebanese Christian. All 16 were Arab, Arabic speakers. I was the anomaly in the room. It was like, who let this guy in this classroom to teach these students? And, and, and the, the thesis really was that the, the school had, had opened the media modulus, and the first exhibition was Descent, Creative Descent. So I fomented or attempted to foment some sense of, of voice that would allow them to, if necessary, if willing to, articulate things that they might have had some dissension about, something that they didn't agree with. And in order to, to, to invite and welcome this, I commandeered a very, very small conference room in the school. And I emphasize commandeered. I learned that there was a, uh, a, a portal where you could reserve a room, a conference room, every week. And I simply wrote, writer's room. And every week that room was reserved for us, and we took it over. We put up things on the, on the, on the uh, cork boards in the room. And you have to understand, if you know the business, the movie business, the writer's room is a very uh, tight, community space where you freely express yourself and where you learn the, the mantra, yes and, not yes but, yes and. So if somebody has an idea, you never say, I don't like that idea. 
you say yes and dot, dot, dot. So it's a space where you create collaboratively. And in this space, we spent a lot of time reflecting on what it meant for them to be who they are on the cusp of becoming who they wish to be. Let me break that down a little bit. This was a space where we could discuss what are their aspirations. As I shared, many of them were seniors. What comes next? Jobs, marriage, arranged marriage, graduate school. Who, who are you going to be now that you've had four years? As many of us know, where you go to university, that's a place where you get to begin to define yourself. And yet, who are you once you leave the university where your traditions and your culture and family have certain defining characteristics. So this is where I'm going to take a minute and just share with you some words from my former students. I prompted them to think about articulating who they saw themselves to be. And I asked them to do an assignment which was to describe your most significant identity signifier. How do you see yourself versus how others might see you? And I'm going to share just three. There were 16 students, and I'm not going to bore you with all of them. The most powerful signifier of my identity would be wearing my hijab different, depending on where I am in the world. How I wear my hijab in Qatar is not the same way I would wear it in the United States. In Qatar, I would lean towards black shalas mostly, and if colored, it would only be lime. When traveling abroad, I either wear a turban or a beanie to cover my hair. This is because I might not feel safe with how people might perceive my identity when wearing the hijab due to the negative connotations surrounding it. Another student. I think the most powerful signifier of my identity is my physical appearance. How I look is the first people see. My race and religion are usually what I'm identified with. I wear a headscarf, so people immediately know I'm Muslim. My complexion is dark, so people conclude I'm from Africa. I identify as Qatari Palestinian female. It's easy to simply choose the constituents of culture, such as nationalism or religion or family, as important parts and contributors to my identity. But truthfully, all three exist subversively within me, given the effects they've had on me growing up. I love my religion. I love my family. I love my Palestinian and Qatari cultures. I love practicing patriotism. Those were just three. And, and what was important, and as I, I cited to you, this was not a class. All the students, except for one, were born in Qatar. Although many of them self-identify with the country where their parents are born. And so yet they had something very much in common, growing up in Qatar, very much in common, all being uh, Arabic speakers. A lot in common, as I stated to you, 15 of the 16 uh, being Muslim. All being at a very small American university in Qatar. And yet they had very distinct differences. And this was important if we were going to create a story together. So from these conversations, and so I'm going to end so Michael and I have time to speak. You'll have some questions. They wish to make a story about Aisha, a Qatari female who aspires to attend Harvard's Graduate School of Architecture and Design four days before her application is due. She arrives home to learn that her mother has accepted 
a marriage proposal. I'd like to share with you the seed. يعني كم مرة بعيد؟ وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. أنا ما قلت لكم ما أحب أكل في الصالة؟ إنزين. <تصفيق> ها وش رأيك في الموضوع؟ لا 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 مو بتناقشة معك في الموضوع بعد. هي أكيد أمي قالت لك تقنعني. أول مرة تتفقون على شيء. يا بنتي عاشة. لا الوقت ما سوى. أحتاج أخلص الرسم حق الجامعة. أنت اللي شجعتني أن أقدم. عاشة. مفروض تكون واقف معي. يا بنتي. فهد خوش ريال بس ما عندك سبب انك ما تعطينا فرصه وهي الكلام اللي امي قالتك تقوله يا يبا انت بس اقتنعي اول شيء وبعدين عطي الموضوع فرصه ما عندي وقت الحين افكر في الموضوع جدولي وتركيزي كله مع الشغل ما اقدر افكر الله اكبر الله اكبر عذرك يا بنتي انا بروح اصلي قولي يا تمك قولي لها ان ابوي راح يصلي
يما لا توسخين الارض توني منطفه البيت قطي في الزباله عاشا وين ربعك اليوم شفتي ابوك اليوم عقب ما توشت وامس لا تدرين يا عاشا كنت مخطوبه قبل ابوك كنت مخطوبه ثلاث مرات ورفضوني بعد الخطوبه ليش كنت توني متوفى وما اهتميت للموضوع كنت لاهيه بوظيفتي بعدها تميت ست سنين عانس في بيت هلي عاشا ست سنين في بيت هلي شفت ربعي كلهم يتزوجون ويكملون حياتهم عشان كذي يا عايشة أبيش تفكرين في الموضوع عطي فهد فرصة عشان كذي تقوليني كل هاي ليش تبين تفهميني إن الزواج يرتب أمه البنت إنه يعدل حياتها عايشة لا لا قوليلي شو نبغي غير حياتك كل زواج فيها مشاكل صدق تبي تعرفين شو اللي تغير بحياتي انا بقول لك الله عطاني اياك
So uh, this is, was a proof of concept, but I want to, in bringing to a close, tell you a story about the story. To a person in this class, if when asked about marriage, they either said, I don't want to get married. If I do get married, I want to marry somebody that I love and not somebody that is proposed to me by my family. To a person, male and female, this was. The writing, however, of this film stalled, or this web series stalled, because they could not write the final chapter. They were conflicted. If they wrote it with Aisha not going downstairs, how would that be re received actually by their families and friends if they saw the piece? But I would say to them, but, you know, if it was, if it's you, what, you know, well, no, I don't, Professor, I don't want to get married, and so forth and so on. So I actually had to <laughs> write the last, <laughs> because they, they could not write it, because everything that they wrote was not true. And so what I say to you by not true is that your character has to be active and transform. And you can't, and they had episodes where the father saved her or this happened. So I, I, I share that with you to say that not simply or should we be telling the stories that matter, but we are in a time where who gets to tell whose story is what really matters. And this is where I found myself in Qatar, in Doha, with young people who are working towards being the authors of their stories. I want to say to you all in closing that in so many ways my time in Doha and Qatar I think embodies the Qatar America Institute. I was there at an American university in Qatar bridging two cultures, two countries, different traditions. What I was able to contribute was to encourage the students that I encountered to find their voice, not to reject their culture or tradition, but to find their voice. And in that way, I was able to give them something. But what they gave me in return, in thinking about a bridge or a connection between two places, they gave me the sense of what is possible not to take things for granted, to be respectful, to care about family, nation, culture, but to ultimately decide for oneself who one is and to tell one's own stories and not to let others tell stories that distort or degrade or mislead or misrepresent. Thank you. I think she got into Harvard, and, and if you go up to Harvard, you'll see her uh, in the halls of the Graduate School of uh, Architecture and Design. <laughs> that's great. Um, boy, that's uh, very provocative, Professor, because um, you got the tension between tradition and modernity, and you've got the tension between what the West would scoff at as an arrangement, and yet the divorce rate among those who freely choose is a telltale sign about, you know, poorly chosen mates or 
motivations that cannot withstand subsequent lives that are lived. Now, there's choice in that. But it is ironic that in some instances, if the message is you will learn to love the person with whom you are fit versus finding the ideal romantic partner that might extend uh, the life of a relationship. I don't, that's just what's jumping off in my mind. But to focus even more specifically on, and, and I think it's very interesting that she wants, to, she, she wants to be an architect of her life, right? She's drawing plans. And I think about all of that, you know, they say if you, if you wanna, you know, make God laugh, make your own plans. And drawing plans, sculpting, designing, figuring one's life. It's a beautiful metaphor there that you've uh, chosen as the heart of the film. But talk to us, though, about, um, you know, there's an inevitable in this age, this Trumpian age of malignant mendacity and of vulgar mediocrity, right? a sense of choice that emerges dissent that we are that we are told doesn't exist in a culture like that right it's all rapacious collectivism it has nothing to do with individual choice and for you to probe the dimensions of dissent within a culture that ostensibly doesn't you know doesn't cater to that is is beautiful and luminous Talk about that tension in, in the film and in the culture. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. I, I think that that's, you know, first as a creative person, mm. it, one always wants to find a tension. Mm. And, and, and it, it would be finding a tension that may not be simply uh, resolved. So to the question, does she get married? Well, she doesn't go downstairs at that moment. She does send off her application. Mm. But if, you know, maybe the next episode we find her being married. Mm. In real life, I, th I think that this is the interesting, I'm going to use tension, but what, what is interesting going forward for a, a plethora of young people who are now being educated in Western, US based, uh, institutions mm -hmm. with a basic understanding that we have the freedom to teach whatever we wish to teach, mm -hmm. that it is not uh, censored or constricted. And many of us do, respectful of where we are, but mm -hmm. teach things that uh, come from our own sensibilities. So what will happen? So I'll just give you, so uh, one student, Moved to the United States, married a man. Uh, two other other students are now, four other students that I taught are now getting married. Mm -hmm. People of their choices. Mm -hmm. um, three or four or five or six young women are persuading their fathers, principally, but their families, to allow them to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I I. I Personally, hope that I will live long enough and have the, the invitation to be there in 10 years, mm -hmm. in 15 years, because I think that's where mm -hmm. the, the, the sowing or the fomenting of mm -hmm. ideas will manifest. Right. And you nailed it. The, the collision of modernity and tradition, mm -hmm. I don't know what the yield will be. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, Ultimately, that is not my. Right. It's not mine to predict or mine, mine to mine. It is right. ultimately for the citizens of the nation, the, the young and the old, the modernity and tradition to mm. figure out who they want to be. No, no, it's, it's, it's powerful. You know, when you also think about the fact that we're we're talking about a patriarchal culture, right? And so again under the rubric of patriarchy, dissent is squashed, deference is paid um, based on gender, and rule is extended on the same principle, right? 
And yet, so we think we're free in the West. And yet toxic masculinity just pervades the culture, right? The devastating consequence of which we've just now seen the Me Too movement, the recent uh, uh, conviction of Harvey Weinstein uh, as a first gestural moment in that movement to hold that kind of extreme patriarchy to account. So while we're, you know, belittling others, judging others, looking askance at others uh, for the lack of choice, then we look at what we're doing for what we got, the, 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 the sum of what we have may be at least questioned through that prism. So I say all that to say, how do you resist as a prominent filmmaker, as an American, as an African in America, going to Qatar, how do you resist the Western bias, the Western inclination to impose our conception of what freedom is, of what free speech is, right, and of what democratic small d ideals are when we see it so uh, jarringly uh, opposed in a culture that is far older than ours, far more ancient, in its uh, abilities to sustain human beings, how do you resist just wearing that hat and looking at things through those glasses and allow the story to breathe and the culture to, to exist on its own terms? I'll answer it in, in twofold. And, mm -hmm. and, and I would say that um, Harvey was not the first, Bill was the first. Well, yeah. So uh, it just, you know the first domino. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to answer your question twofold. If you invited me to your house, right. Bill Cosby, by the way. Yeah. This way. yeah. No, you know? <laughs> you know Clinton. No, well, Clinton Bill, did not go to jail. Okay. Clinton did not go to jail. Bill Cosby went to jail. Right. Harvey is in jail trying to get out. Right. Uh, <laughs> Michael, if you invited me to your house, mm. and I came in and I started to move the furniture around, what would you do? I'd say, hey, man, somebody's finally uh, doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 would, you would throw my... I, I would love you. No, no. <laughs> you, you, you would throw Damn. my butt, butt out, right? <laughs> so it, 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 it's the, Brown, it's the <laughs> recognition that I'm, you know, first and foremost a guest. In mm -hmm. fact, truly, it's a, it's a fascinating nation, and right. it's complicated in this way. Yes? Uh... 25 to 30 percent of the people who live there are actually federal. Everybody else is a guest. And I use the word guest. I'm there at somebody's permission. So I, that's why I use the analogy. If I'm the guest at your house, I'm going to, you know, I am a courteous person, but I'm going to be courteous uh, initially. I'm not going to even tell you what I think you should do in, in redesigning your home, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that's, that's kind of, for me, uh, going there. I, I, I see a great, I saw a great benefit to learn and to discover. And when you teach, as I have, at a school that has students from probably 40 different nations, mm -hmm. that is more than 75% female, I, I recognized right away that there was a great deal that I could learn. Mm -hmm. So there was self-interest. But I'll tie this to my other hat that I wear, and that I am a filmmaker. I make documentary films. And the, my approach to documentary filmmaking is more often than not a question, not a, a conclusion that I already have that I'm seeking to prove mm -hmm. in terms of the work that I'm doing. But I hope to arrive someplace, whether it's an interview or spending time in a community, and discover something pull back something, reveal something. And so here's the truth. I was there two years and just ready now to perhaps pull back a curtain or two based on my own uh, perception. Mm -hmm. I didn't arrive there saying, I'm going to tell, uh, I'm going to tell them what's wrong with them. I'm going to tell them what's right with them. I knew that I needed to learn about the culture, the country a little bit before I could do anything that would be truthful and authentic. But it comes back to, in every, every example you have given, 
you know, when I grew up, we had the expression, who died and made you God? Yeah. What, 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 what would give me the right, even though it's in the media, questions about workers' rights uh, and, 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 and that sort of thing, and, and questions about the nature of how, whether women have rights or not, but I'll tell you, the young women I taught all felt that they had a voice. Uh, it maybe was only within the confines of the university, but they felt very empowered. They spoke of themselves as feminists. So uh, that's my my approach, mm-hmm. I, and mm-hmm. I think that uh, that's really you know the right approach. Just yeah. Learn something before you want to uh, tell someone what to think. Right. So as um, a documentary maker, a documentarian, you're documenting human motivation, human behavior, uh, the interaction of, as we saw here, identity and institution, you know, and the interaction between, um, you know, individuals within a family and the degree to which that circumscribes their freedom and ability to choose. So what's the difference? Right, because this is not a documentary, right? So this is narrative, nonfiction, wh- whatever it is. This right? is this is uh, fiction, straight, right? But <clears throat> what is what is the value and power and payoff of say doing something like this? Because if you go in there and make a documentary, it seems to be politically far more risky, at least initially. It buys into what what you were saying earlier. You're trying to resist, right? I don't, I want to, it's like with the prophet. Let me, I sat where they sat, saw what they saw before I spoke the word of God, right? So you want to figure out what you're saying first and who you're saying it to and what the issues are. You don't even know. So you get there and you sit for a while, right? And so what's the value of a nonfiction, I mean, of a fictional account that can get at some truths that perhaps are too immediate? too painful, too provocative, and quite frankly, too politically risky in, say, a documentary. What's, what's the value of that? I, I did not teach documentary uh, in, in, at NUQ, Northwestern University in Qatar, but I have seen some of the work that students have done, and I'd say that with nonfiction, there is a, a particular type of subversion mm-hmm. to challenge the patriarchy or to challenge group thought or group mm-hmm. think. And one example comes to mind of, a, of a, a young woman who made a film about three women who, who had their own businesses that were actually creating objects that women wear. So why is that subversive? Well, women who own their own business, maybe not be perceived that such a thing exists, creating things for women. So the whole film was about women's empowerment mm. without ever stating women's empowerment, so subversive. But fiction also has to take on a, a certain subversion, and that's why I did share the anecdote that uh, the students, the writers uh, of the series, of which there were three, there were four directors, they could not come up with a satisfactory ending mm. because of their concern uh, for how they might be perceived, mm-hmm. and and yet, you know, everybody may. I would like to make sure that I'm clear. This is not my story. I just right. serve the role of shepherd mm-hmm. uh, to, and at times, in, uh, encouraging them. But I think that uh, I think that each has its own opportunity to confront. Probably, if it's an a fiction, you could always go to mom or dad, mm. grandfather or grandmother, and say, it's just a story. 